Thank you. I feel like I should do as they do in the theaters in New York. Please turn off your cell phones. If you have any candies you feel you will need to suck on during the performance, please take them out and unwrap them now. <laughs> Welcome to this installment of the De La Pietra lecture series. Uh, as those of you who've been here before know, the purpose of this series, the purpose uh, De, La Pietra, De La Pietra's had in supporting it and the purpose that we have in, in mounting these lecture series is to bring to campus, to bring to Stony Brook and the, please turn <laughs> off your phone. <clears throat> Candies, anyone? <clears throat> to bring to Stony Brook and the Simon Center, uh, mathematicians and physicists, or more generally scientists, who are doing important, cutting edge, innovative work, but also scientists who can explain their subject to a general audience and communicate some of the excitement of their subject to that audience. And we're very pleased today to have as this De La Pietra lecturer, Professor John Schwartz from Caltech. He received his undergraduate degree in mathematics, I want to add, from Harvard in 1962, his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley in 66. He was um, at Princeton from 66 to 72 as an instructor, lecturer, and assistant professor. And then in 72, he moved to Caltech where he ascended through the ranks and is now the Harold Brown Professor of Physics. He is one of the earliest and strongest proponents of string theory. In fact, uh, what I consider the Bible of supersymmetric string theory is the book that he wrote with Michael Green and Edward Witten, Green Schwartz Witten, or GSW as it's known in the trade. It's the, as I said, the Bible of superstring theory. For his work in string theory, he's been honored with many prestigious prizes in physics, including the Dirac Medal in 1989 and the Heinemann Prize for Mathematical Physics in 2002. He was a MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 1987, and he's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences. He will talk to us today about string theory, past, present, and future. Please welcome Professor John Schwartz. Thank you for that kind introduction. So it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you and tell you about string theory, which is something I've been involved with for a long time and I enjoy talking about. So, so in this talk, I'll begin by telling you the, how string theory originated in the 1960s and present some of the basic concepts in the first part. Th then I'll explain the difficulties that we encountered in the early stages, which led to changing the direction in string theory and using it for unifications, which I'll just explain what that means in the second part. And then in the third part, I'll, I'll discuss some of the exciting developments that happened in the 1980s and the 1990s, and just briefly mention some of the more recent things as well. And, and then finally, I'll, I'll discuss some of the remaining challenges uh, that we are facing uh, that haven't been resolved yet. So, so let's turn to the basic story here. So, in the 1960s, uh, one of the important problems that theoretical physicists were uh, confronting was trying to understand the strong nuclear force. And this is the uh, force that holds protons and neutrons together inside the nucleus of an atom. If you only had electrical forces, it would blow apart, right, because the protons would repel each other. But they stick together inside nuclei, and that's because of the strong nuclear force. And at that, in the 60s, we did not have a theoretical understanding of that force. So this is, all, in, in somewhat more modern viewpoint, we would say that this is also the force 
that holds quarks and gluons together inside the neutron and proton, since we now understand that neutrons and protons are not elementary particles, but have, uh, have the quarks and gluons as constituents. So a correct theory of the strong nuclear force, we, we already understood in the 1960s, should incorporate some well-established principles. And those principles were relativity, special relativity, which is developed by Einstein in the early part of the 20th century, and quantum mechanics, which was developed in the 1920s. Uh, quantum mechanics, uh, I, won't, I, I won't be able to give you any details about special relativity and quantum mechanics, but let me just say that special relativity addresses the strange behavior of particles that are, whose motion approaches the speed of light, and quantum mechanics deals with the properties of matter at the very shortest distances or at the lowest temperatures. So a mathematical theory incorporating these principles, uh, if it makes one further assumption, namely that the particles that are being described can be treated as mathematical points, if you make that additional assumption, then you land in the type of theory that's called quantum field theory. So quantum field theory is a special, is a relativistic quantum theory of point particles. Now, in addition, I, just as an aside, in addition to the strong nuclear force, there are other forces that are known in nature. Two of them are very familiar to you. They are electromagnetism, which, so that's electricity and magnetism, and gravity, those are familiar, and perhaps somewhat less familiar is the weak nuclear force. So those are the four forces that physicists have, been, have identified experimentally. It's possible that there are others that will be discovered in the future, but those are the ones that are known today. Now, what I'm going to be talking about, as the title implies, is strings. And so strings are physical objects that, unlike point particles, uh, have extension. So they, they can be thought of as lines in space, which move around. Now, when you're talking about a point particle, you characterize them by the mass, among other things. And the, pro the property of a string that plays the role of mass I is its tension or its energy density. So that's a fundamental parameter in string theory that sets the scale. Now, a theory that's based on strings can account for various features of the strong nuclear force. And what was being discovered in the 1960s when I was a graduate student in Berkeley uh, and there were experiments that were going on in Berkeley and other places, Brookhaven down the road here, uh, is, is that there are a lot of particles that undergo the strong nuclear force, and these are generically referred to as hadrons. So hadrons are the types of particles that feel the strong nuclear force. And it, it was realized in the late 1960s that by basing a theory on strings rather than point particles, one could account for the rich spectrum of hadrons that were being discovered experimentally, as well as some of the high energy behavior of their interactions. Now, the, the first string theory originated in the late 1960s, starting with an important paper by Gabriella Veneziano, and immediately thereafter, hundreds of people jumped into it and became quite an active enterprise at that time. So when we talk about strings, there, there are two kinds of strings that we consider. On the, on the one hand, strings can be just lines with ends that flop around, so we call these open strings. Or they, or they can form loops so that they are topologically circles. And uh, so closed strings are loops without any ends. So those are the, the only two possibilities for the geometry of strings in the, in the basic setup. So the, so the basic idea that we had back in the late 60s was that the, the, when you treat the string quantum mechanically, uh, that the kinds of modes, the ways it can oscillate and move around are, there are, are given by discrete possibilities. That's one of the characteristic features of quantum theory, is that you have discrete possibilities for the motions. And so each of these distinct types of motions of the string was then the idea was that that would be identified as a different particle. So th this was kind of an exciting idea because it, it, was a, it was already a unification of a type. So the idea was that even though we were discovering hundreds and thousands of hadrons, these strongly interacting particles, then perhaps they could all be viewed as being different 
modes of oscillation of, of an object, namely the string, uh, and so that, that there's really just a unique object, the string, and, and it's just it's different manifestations uh, that give rise to these different particles that were being discovered, the rich spectrum of hadrons. So that was the idea that we had, and people got very excited, and there was a lot of work on this in the late 60s, early 70s, but already around 1970, 71, it was realized that there were some very serious problems. It w even though it had the advantages that I mentioned, it also had some serious difficulties. And it's important to focus on things that don't work as well as the things that do work. And one of the really bizarre things that came as a complete surprise to us was that the theory, the original string theory that was developed was mathematically inconsistent, or it was inconsistent with quantum theory, uh, unless you assumed that instead of having three dimensions of space, which we know is the right answer, that, that there should be 25. The fact that it was an integer and a positive one it was just the consequence of the math. It might have come out pi over 6, but it didn't. It came out 26. And so, so that was a surprise. 20, so 26, when we speak of 26 dimensions, we're including time. So there's always one time dimension, but the, the number of spatial directions is depends on the theory that you're discussing, and this original string theory required 25 spatial dimensions, which is 22 more than we know exist. So that, that was completely unexpected, and it was definitely not what we wanted. So, there was another serious problem with the original string theory, and that is in quantum theory, all, all elementary particles fall into two categories that are called bosons and fermions. So there are these two different kinds of elementary particles that have very different features. And many of the particles that we know and love, like the electron and the proton and the quark, are fermions. And some of the others, like the photon, which is the quantum of light, is a boson. So both kinds of particles are well known. But the original string theory only contained bosons and not fermions. So it certainly couldn't be realistic without any fermions. So that was another serious problem, in addition to the dimension of space. Now, a second theory was discovered uh, quite early in this game, in the beginning of 1971. And the second theory contained fermions as well as bosons. And, and, and this uh, re work originated with Pierre Ramon, who wrote down an equation that applied to fermionic strings, and, and work that I did with André Neveu, which described a new type of bosonic string. And soon we realized that Ramon's fermions meshed very nicely with our bosons, and we could think of it as a single string theory of bosons and fermions. And this theory, uh, unlike the previous one, only required 10 dimensions of space time. So nine space dimensions and one time dimension. So we thought well, this was an important step in the right direction, and we, we figured the next theory we discovered would have four dimensions, and that would be the right answer. Well, that's not the way the history played out, but that was our expectation at that time. A, a curious footnote is that we actually did find a four-dimensional theory soon after this, but oddly, that theory had two space and two time dimensions, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it wasn't exactly right either. And, <laughs> uh, in any case, the development of this 10-dimensional string theory led to the discovery of a, new, uh, of a symmetry that was previously unknown, which came to be known as supersymmetry. And uh, this uh, supersymmetry is unlike symmetries that have been considered previously. So the standard symmetries that uh, physicists had worked with in the past would relate the properties of some of the bosons to other of the bosons, and it would relate the properties of some fermions to other fermions. But this new kind of symmetry, supersymmetry, relates the properties of the bosons to the properties of the fermions. And, uh, and that was something that hadn't been previously considered. So, so st when we're dealing with a theory that has this type of symmetry, supersymmetry, then uh, if it's a string theory, then we call the string superstrings. So that, that's a name that's frequently used. Now, both of these string theories, the 26-dimensional uh, bosonic string theory and the 10-dimensional superstring theory, uh, when you study the spectrum of the oscillation modes, which we want to associate to the different particles, uh, we found that among these oscillation modes, there were examples that correspond to particles that don't have any mass. And 
that may sound strange if you haven't thought about this before, a particle that doesn't have any mass necessarily travels with the speed of light. And, and there are particles of that type that are known in nature. The photon, which is the quantum of electromagnetism, the, the particles that make up light, if you will, are massless, since they would obviously travel with the speed of light. And, uh, uh, and, and there are particles associated with gravity as well that are known as gravitons and should also be massless. So having massless particles isn't bad in itself. The problem was that we were trying to describe hadrons, and among the, the particles that have strong nuclear forces, and among the hadrons, uh, it was known that none of them are massless. So having massless particles was also a problem uh, from that point of view. So as I just said, this was a disturbing fact since every hadron has a positive mass. So, so we did the obvious thing. We tried to modify the string theories to describe only massive particles and to describe four-dimensional space-time. Uh, we were committed to this program, and that seemed the direction to go. But we, we used all the, we as a community, used all the ingenuity we could uh, conjure up, and all of these attempts inevitably led to mathematical inconsistencies and had to be discarded. So we were, so we were stuck with these peculiar theories that were mathematically beautiful and intriguing, but didn't seem to solve the problem we wanted to solve as, of understanding the strong nuclear force, even though that was the original motivation. Now, if that weren't bad enough, there was another thing that happened, which completely killed string theory <laughs> in 1973, and that was the discovery of another theory called quantum chromodynamics, abbreviated QCD, and this is a theory of the strong nuclear force that is much more conventional. It is a quantum field theory based on point particles, which I mentioned earlier, the quarks and gluons. And, and this quantum field theory very quickly became clear was the right theory of the strong nuclear force. So there was no need for this string theory, which was giving all these crazy results I described. Uh, here was the right theory. And so the obvious thing happened. Namely, uh, most of the people in the community decided since QCD is correct, there was no need for string theory, and so it was abandoned by all the hundreds of people who were working on it. And only a community of, so the community of several hundred theoretical physicists was reduced just to a handful of diehards. Including, including myself, which is what it says on the next, which is, which is what it says on the next slide. And <laughs> uh, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to summarize what I said so far, and ask for questions, and then I'll move to part two. So, so string theory was developed to describe the strong nuclear force. This was unsuccessful because the string theories that were discovered require unrealistic extra dimensions of space and massless particles. And furthermore, the correct theory of the strong nuclear force, QCD, was discovered. So string theory was abandoned by, by all but a few diehards, including myself. So, are there, at this point, are there any questions? Why are you giving this talk? <laughs> That's, the answer to that is stay tuned. <laughs> okay. Yes? Does it, uh, what, one of the properties you described of string theory was the uh, uh, unification, so that you could have a single entity oh. that could describe, in oh. terms of uh, tension and energy, various particles. That's right. Does QCD have that property? Um, <coughs> well, QCD does describe all the hadrons, but that's not exactly the way that it does it. It's more, it's more complicated. It's very hard in QCD to understand the properties of hadrons. Even though the theory is fully formulated, uh, we, we don't have nice mathematical tools for doing that. And, it, and to get the properties of hadrons out of QCD involves massive computer calculations, which are very difficult. So it would be nice to have a string theory of hadrons, which, uh, because that would, even which was equivalent to QCD, but it would be a reformulation of the theory in which it was easier to understand the properties of hadrons. And many people are working on that problem to even today, but it hasn't yet been solved. Okay, so I'll move on to part two now. You've got one more question. Oh, okay. So this is a simple question. How does one or a group of people go about developing the theories? Do you sit in a room and talk about it? Well, sure. Yeah, we meet in various sizes of collaborations, have conferences, and 
interactions of all sorts and small collaborations, large collaborations, conferences. Thinking alone. Thinking alone. Some, <laughs> yeah. so everybody has their own style. Some people like to work alone. Some like to work in groups. <coughs> Come to places like this. That's right. People with similar interests. Exactly. So, so before, so so the so the answer to the question why continue doing this will be unification. But before describing why string theory is good for unification, I should first describe what we want to unify. So there are two things that we want to unify. One is something called the standard model. So this is a quantum field theory that combines QCD with a theory that of the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force. So three of the four forces that I mentioned at the beginning are combined in something called the standard model, which is an extremely successful theory. And I'll say a little bit more about it on the next slide. And the other thing that we want to combine that with is general relativity. And this is Einstein's theory of gravity, which is an improvement on Newton's theory of gravity. That was de this was developed about 100 years ago by Einstein. And uh, it's not, it's not a quantum, Einstein's theory is not quantum mechanical. When something's not quantum mechanical, we usually say it's classical. So that classical means not quantum mechanical. So general relativity is a classical theory of gravity. So we would like to combine these. Because the standard model contains three of the forces and the general relativity contains the fourth. So we would put all four of them together if we could unify these two things. So, on the, so the standard model describes the properties and interactions of particles that make up matter, which are quarks, which are, the, as I said earlier, the constituents of nuclear particles like neutrons and protons, and leptons, which are an, an example of a lepton is, a, is the electron, and there are several other leptons that are known, such as, for example, neutrinos. And then there are particles that are responsible for forces in the standard model, and these are the photon, the quantum of light, gluons, the particles that hold the quarks together, and, and, and uh, another particle, the uh, Higgs particle, who, whose discovery at the LHC was just announced on July 4th of 2012. But it's, it's been part of the standard model for 40 years. It just took 40 years to, to find it experimentally. So the, the standard model doesn't contain gravity. And it has many arbitrary features for which we would like to find a deeper explanation. Uh, so those are, those are its shortcomings. And, and so far, the LHC has not found evidence for physics that goes beyond the standard model. But as I'll indicate, we, we're hoping that they eventually will. So the, the experiments are, will continue. And so the search to higher energies to shorter distances continues. So here, here's a picture of uh, the part of Switzerland and France where the LHC is located. It's deep underground, but it's a circular ring of radius 4.3 kilometers in which protons collide going around in one direction, collide with protons going around in the other direction. And when it reaches its design energy, which it hasn't done yet, it will, there will be 7 trillion electron volts in each of the beams. The, mo the highest energy they've achieved so far is 4 plus 4 rather than 7 plus 7. But when they turn back on in about a year or so, they should reach the design energy. And this is where the uh, Higgs particle was discovered. So there, in f there are four places where the beams intersect, and there are detectors to study the collisions at these intersection points. And in two of these detectors, known as ATLAS and CMS, uh, they independently uh, discovered the Higgs particle. So now let me turn to general relativity. This is a very successful and beautiful theory that Einstein developed to describe gravity in terms of the geometry of space-time. So one doesn't, ordin prior to this, one didn't think of space and time as having geometry. But uh, Einstein realized that if you allow for the possibility that the space and time can be, have curvature, that this, this could describe gravity. And that this uses mathematics of a type known as differential geometry, which was developed by Riemann. Uh, much earlier. And the, ba the basic mathematical object one deals with there is something called the metric tensor, which is a symmetric matrix. And when this metric is treated in accord with the rules of quantum mechanics, one learns that the gravitational force 
should be mediated by a massless particle that has two units of angular momentum. We say that it has spin two. So this, this notion of a particle having a certain amount of spin is a quantum mechanical idea. It's one of the properties of quantum mechanics that you can assign spins to particles. And the graviton is the unique massless spin two particle. It's the quantum of light, of gravity, in much the same way that the photon is the quantum of light. Now, I mentioned that one of the difficulties that string theory had in describing the hadrons was the existence of massless particles. And it turns out that one of the massless particles, which is a mode of the closed string, has precisely the right properties, namely zero mass and spin two, to be the graviton, the particle responsible for the gravitational force. Now this seemed like a bizarre idea because the graviton certainly does not have strong nuclear interactions when we were trying to describe hadrons, which do. So, so if you want to take this idea seriously that, that string theory should describe gravity, then you're changing the program in a dramatic manner. So at accessible energies, the interactions of the string theory graviton agree exactly with those of the graviton in Einstein's theory of general relativity. So one could say that string theory predicts the existence of gravity. We were unable to get rid of this massless spin two particle in the hadron spectrum, in the string theory spectrum, and it is gravity, <laughs> whether or not that's what you want. And so obviously gravity was known before string theory, so saying that string theory predicts gravity is a little bit unhistorical or anti-historical, but it, anyway, it gives you the idea. So the massless, it turns out that the massless modes of open strings are particles that have spin one, so half as much spin as the graviton. And at low energies, they behave just like the gauge particles that are responsible for forces uh, in the standard model. So the spin one particles can describe electromagnetism, the weak nuclear force, and the strong nuclear force. You have to do things just right to get the right forces, but you, you get the right type of forces uh, automatically from open strings. And in more modern constructions, there are other ways of doing it as well. So these facts uh, led Joël Scherck, uh, a French collaborator, and myself in 1974 to propose using string theory for the unification of all forces, including gravity. Uh, so we abandoned the idea of just making it a theory of hadrons and used, thought of using string theory for unification. So we stumbled upon a possible realization of what you might call Einstein's dream. Because in his later years, Einstein worked hard on the problem of unification. And what that meant for him was giving a theory that combined electromagnetism with gravity. He didn't know yet about the nuclear forces. They weren't understood in those days, and so, which is one of the reasons he couldn't possibly have been successful, even though he was quite clever. And uh, uh, so, but anyway, that, yeah, he, it was a good program that he launched, but it, it took a while for it to be realized. So when strings were supposed to describe hadrons, their size had to be, the typical size of a string had to be about the size of a proton or neutron, and that's about 10 to the minus 13 centimeters, roughly. So, so that's the size of a nucleus of an atom. And, and to account for the observed strength of gravity, the typical size has to be closer to what we call the Planck length. So this is a number that was first computed by Max Planck, and the reason is that this you just need to know three basic constants of nature. So H is the basic quantum that Planck discovered, and G is Newton's constant, which characterizes gravity, and C is the speed of light, which is ca characteristic for relativity. So if you want a relativistic quantum theory of gravity, H, G, and C are your unit, they're your natural units, and if you just combine them using dimensional analysis to make a length and put in the observed numbers, you find that the distance is approximately 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, which is 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the size of a nucleus. Planck was the first person to know H, which is why he was the first person to do this calculation. So, so this was a dramatic change in viewpoint, because suddenly, with the changing the program in this way, our string suddenly shrank by 20 orders of magnitude. <laughs> 
20 orders of magnitude is the ratio, roughly, of the size of an atom to the size of the solar system. So that, that's how much our sh strings shrank. <laughs> but fortunately, the mathematics didn't change, so we could continue going about our business. Now, th this using strings for unification had some additional advantages. So prior attempts to construct a quantum version of general relativity had assumed point particles, meaning they worked with quantum field theory. And all of these attempts gave rise to infinite results for quantum effects uh, that didn't make sense. In the technical jargon, we say that there were non-renormalizable ultraviolet divergences. But that just means that there were infinite results that didn't make sense. By contrast, string theory gives sensible finite results for these same uh, quantum effects. There are no ultraviolet divergences. So that was good. A second advantage of using string theory for gravity is, is that in a theory of gravity, such as general relativity or string theory, the geometry of space-time is determined by the equations of the theory. We say it's determined by the dynamics. Uh, and so, so you don't put in the fact that, that space-time has a certain geometry. You, you, ha you require that it be a solution to the equations of the theory. So when string theory is used to describe gravity rather than the strong interactions, it makes sense to consider solutions to the equations of string theory in, in which the extra dimensions form a tiny compact space which might have the shape of a sphere or a torus or something much more complicated. But whatever it is, the important thing is that they, fall, they form a very small space. And, and so, so the extra dimensions, if they're small enough, uh, wouldn't be observable at low energies. Because to observe a space that's very small, you need very high energies. And so, so they haven't found extra dimensions at the LHC. So that means, it tells you that extra dimensions, if they exist, have got to be smaller than a certain distance. So space can appear to be three-dimensional, even if there are additional dimensions of space. So there's a tiny space attached to every point in three-dimensional space. You can't sense it because uh, your quantum mechanical wave functions spread uniformly on, on that space. Now, experiments at the LHC are looking for signs of extra dimensions. Some theorists have suggested that they might be able to discover them there. But my guess is that these extra dimensions are too small to be observed at the LHC. So I don't expect them to be discovered. But I could be wrong, so it's important that they keep looking. Now these extra dimensions, even if they're invisible and can't be seen at the LHC, are important for understanding the ordinary four-dimensional physics. So when I say four dimensions, I mean three space and one time. So geometry, the geometry of these invisible, compact extra dimensions determines the types of particles and forces that occur in the ordinary four-dimensional space-time. So they have dramatic consequences even, though they, even if they're invisible. So determining the, this geometry is essential for understanding the detailed properties of the known elementary particles, as well as ones yet to be discovered. And this is an important area of current research. It involves a lot of fancy math, I should say, too. Because describing six-dimensional spaces is a complicated business. Now, the, this superstring theory, this 10-dimensional superstring theory, as I said, has this symmetry property called supersymmetry that relates the bosons and the fermions. And so if the theory successfully accounts for the known elementary particles, then, it should, then the theory should also give rise to their supersymmetry partners. And none of these partner particles have yet been discovered experimentally. They're being searched for at the LHC. But even though they haven't been discovered, they've already been named. And so this spin a half quarks and leptons have spin zero partners that are called quarks and sleptons. And I always like to point out that I'm not responsible for this language. <laughs> the uh, spin one gauge particles and the spin zero Higgs particles have spin a half 
superpartners that are known as gluinos, neutralinos, and charginos. So the experimentalists are looking for all of these things, but none of them have shown up yet. But there's a good chance, un unlike, in my view, the unlike the case of the extra dimensions, I think there's a good chance that the LHC energy is sufficient to discover some of these. So this is the thing that I'm most optimistic will show up uh, I experimentally as kind of a smoking gun of verification of, of some of these ideas. So let me summarize the second part now. So the goal of string theory was changed from describing the strong nuclear force construct to constructing a unified quantum theory incorporating the standard model, which describes three of the forces, and general relativity, which describes the fourth one. And this converted the shortcomings of string theory, namely extra dimensions and massless particles, into major advantages. And furthermore, supersymmetry requires the existence of new superpartner particles. And this is the distinctive prediction of string theory that, in my opinion, is most likely to be discovered experimentally. Although, to be perfectly honest, there's as yet no sign of it. Any questions before I turn to the next part? Are there any questions on part two? Yes. Simple question. So in your early research, you, you discovered these 10 dimensions, yes. down from 22 or whatever. Yes. And that kind of helped, you know, led to the rejection of the theory. But now you're embracing the idea of the extra dimensions. What led to that? I mean, I think it's too complicated. It was just like, oh, why, why don't we just reduce the size of it? And now we can, it can exist. Yes. So the, the idea that there could be small extra dimensions was actually a very old idea going back to the 1920s, the work of Kaluza and Klein. And they were studying Einstein's general theory of relativity, and they just tried to think about it with an extra dimension. And this was one of the ideas that Einstein and others were pursuing when they were trying to unify uh, gravity with uh, electromagnetism. That just that's the simplest version of that doesn't work, but we, we, we were aware of that history. And so uh, once we were dealing with a theory in which there is geometry for space time, it made sense to use the same kind of thinking to imagine that the extra dimensions uh, could be very small in this way, which is what we did. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Oh yeah, it's a short question. Um, so how does supersymmetry and superstrings um, predict or, or say, does it have anything to say about gravitational waves? About gravitational waves. Uh, yeah. Uh, I th I th well, when we think of gravitational waves, I think it's, you only need to know Einstein's general theory of relativity. You don't need to know about string theory to <laughs> think about gravitational waves. There are experiments underway searching for gravitational waves. And aside from indirect evidence that was announced last week, there's no direct discovery of gravitational waves. But there are experiments underway that are likely to discover them in the next couple of years. Uh, experiment called LIGO, for example. And, but that, that won't be regarded as evidence for string theory when they find them. That's just confirmation of the predictions of general relativity. <coughs> We have indirect evidence for gravitational waves. <laughs> Any other? Why, why do you expect the extra dimension to be compact versus non compact? Yeah. So if, if they w weren't, if they were non compact, unless you do something rather exotic, you won't get the kind of mass gap they mm -hmm. need for a space time. Mm -hmm. There may be more exotic possibilities where something is non compact. <laughs> Conceivable. This is the most straightforward possibility. <coughs> so let me move on. So in the 1980s and 90s, there were a number of interesting developments which I'd like to tell you about now. So an important property of the standard model, which you remember describes three of the forces, is something known as parity violation, which was discovered in the 1950s. And so this is a fact of nature which is a property of the weak nuclear force, which I haven't specifically talked about yet. And, and this property, referred to as parity violation, what it means is that the theory is not symmetrical under mirror reflection. 
So if particles are doing whatever it is they do, and if you were to look at their motions in a mirror, you should be able to realize that they're doing something that was wrong, <laughs> because the, the theory has a definite handedness, and the mirror would, reach, would flip that handedness. So the basic laws of nature have a handedness, at least in the weak nuclear force. And so that, that's an important fact of nature. So any theory that wants to be realistic has got to accommodate this possibility. And parity violation, it turns out, is very difficult to reconcile with quantum mechanics. It works, pro it works beautifully in the standard model. Uh, and, but what can, what can go wrong is when you c consider the effects of quantum mechanics, you can find breakdowns of the theory which are referred to as anomalies. And in the case of the standard model, these anomalies magically cancel and everything is consistent. So, so a any other theory that's going to uh, account for parity violation has to have that same sort of consistency. And for a long time, it was unclear whether parity violation was a possibility in string theory. We, we knew theories that looked like they could give parity violation that were not mirror symmetrical, but we weren't sure whether or not they were consistent with quantum theory. They could have given rise to anomalies. Uh, which would have meant they were inconsistent theories, have to be discarded. And so, th so that question was kind of an open question until 1984 uh, when Michael Green and I discovered uh, a, an anomaly cancellation mechanism uh, that makes parity violation possible in, in string theory. So uh, I, I can't describe the details of how that works, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, anyway, that's what happened. Here, this is, we, we did this work when we were in Aspen, Colorado, at the Aspen Center for Physics, and, and this is a picture of us at that time. Uh, okay. So, uh, so the, 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 it, it was interesting because from the period from about 1974 until 1984, there were only a handful of people working on this stuff, Michael and myself and a few others, but not, not very many. So after more than a decade in the doldrums, string theory suddenly became a hot subject in the mid-1980s, uh, the anomaly cancellation mechanism, together with some subsequent discoveries that I'll mention, uh, convinced uh, many theorists that uh, superstring theory could give a deeper understanding of the standard model as part of a consistent quantum theory that contains gravity. So one of the subsequent discoveries, a group of four Princeton theorists which came to be known as the Princeton String Quartet, uh, qu quickly discovered two new superstring theories. Uh, my, my, Michael and I had formulated three of them, so at that, so at that point we had five superstring theories. The three that we had formulated were called Type 1, Type 2A, and Type 2B, and the two that the Princeton people found were, had these more complicated names that I've written out here. The, the, these mathematical names, SO32 and E8 times E8, those are the names of some symmetry structures that uh, Michael and I had found were the only possibilities that worked, for, where our mechanism worked. So each of these five theories requires the existence of supersymmetry and ten dimensions for space-time. And each of them is otherwise unique. Uh, that there, there, there are no adjustable dimensionless parameters. Now, I mentioned these extra dimensions can get rather complicated, and there, there are some complicated six-dimensional spaces that are called Calabi-Yau spaces, the name for two mathematicians. And another group of four physicists, four authors, considered attaching one of these, proposed using Calabi-Yau spaces for these six extra dimensions. Uh, so there'd be one of these attached to every point in four-dimensional space-time. And th this particular choice of uh, space for the extra dimensions had the, had the virtue uh, that, it gives, that it solves the equations of the theory and, and gives a parity violating supersymmetric theory in ordinary four-dimensional spacetime, which is what we wanted. There are actually lots of possible calabi yau spaces, so this isn't a unique setup, but it's a, a class of, of spaces that you can use for this purpose. So starting with this E8 times E8 heterotic theory and choosing the right Calabi-Yau space, what, people noticed that one could obtain 
a supersymmetric <laughs> extension of the standard model with many realistic features. Back in the 1980s, people focused on all the things that worked right, and we were, that was very impressive. Nowadays, we're more sober-minded, and we focus on the things that don't work, and there are, there are serious shortcomings in these constructions, and nowadays, people do things that are more sophisticated to, to address those issues. So, this, so even this, which involves some, already some complicated math, is inadequate, but it was an important step in the development. So subsequently, another set of revolutionary ideas, which came to be known as dualities, were, were discovered. And dualities are really just equivalences. So, so they, and several of these were discovered in the 1980s and 90s. And, and, and what these dualities do is they relate theories that on the face of it look completely different and imply that they're actually different ways of looking at the same theory. So what one, of, one description might be good for describing the theory in one limit, and the other description might be better for describing it in a different limit, but they're still describing the same theory. So just to illustrate the kind of thing that's going on with these dualities, I'll just say a little bit about one of them. And if, just as an oversimplified example, if you were to suppose that there was just one extra dimension that formed a circle, which is the easiest case of an extra dimension that you can consider, like Kaluza and Klein, uh, it turns out that in string theory, uh, having an extra dimension be a circle of radius r can be equivalent to a circle of radius 1 over r, where when you measure it in string units l, where l is the typical length scale of a string. And this is very strange, because it means that a very large circle is equivalent to a very small circle, which is completely counterintuitive, and reflects the fact that strings sense space-time differently than point particles do. And this kind of equivalence is called t-duality, and it relates the two type 2 theories, and it relates the two heterotic theories. Another kind of duality is uh, a kind of an electric magnetic symmetry. So the, the classical theory of electromagnetism, which was developed by Maxwell in the le later part of the 19th century, is summarized by Maxwell's equations. And, and Maxwell's equations are symmetrical under interchange of electric and magnetic charges and electric and magnetic fields. The only thing that's a little weird about saying this is that magnetic charges have never been discovered experimentally, but otherwise this statement is correct. And, and, and this symmetry has a dramatic generalization in string theory that we called S-duality. S doesn't stand for anything interesting. It's just a mathematical symbol. In any case, this duality relates a theory that has a strength of interaction given by a number g to one that has an interaction strength given by 1 over g, the reciprocal. So, so this means that if one theory is, has very weak interactions because g is small, it's equivalent to a different theory that has very strong interactions because its g is very large. So it's doing for the strength, interaction strength the same thing we were doing previously for the radius of the circular extra dimension. And, and this duality relates the type 2b theory to itself, and it relates the type 1 theory to the SO32 heterotic theory. So, so that... So that means, since we already understood how these string theories behave when they were very weakly interacting, when g was small, these, these, this s-duality meant that we could understand how three of them behave when g is very large. So if we want to understand what type 2b theory is doing when g is very large, we just relate it to itself at, with, with strength 1 over g, which would then be very small, and we understand that. And similarly, you pass between type 1 and and the SO32 heterotic. So, so we understood, after this discovery, we understood the large interaction strength behavior of three of the five theories. But this gave rise to an obvious question. And the obvious question is, what do the other two string theories do when the interaction strength is very large? And the answer to that question was a big surprise. So we wanted to know what the type 2a theory and the E8 times E8 heterotic theory do when their interaction strength becomes very large. Are they equivalent to some other theory with a weak interaction like we found before? Or is there something else going on? And the answer, which was found in the mid-90s, 
uh, was a big surprise. And it turns out is that they, they grow an extra dimension. So they actually become 11-dimensional theories rather than 10-dimensional theories. And the size of this 11th dimension is given by the interaction strength G times the string length scale L. And this new dimension is a circle in the case of the type 2A theory. And it's a, just a line with two ends in the case of the E8 times E8 theory. And in each case, it's size is, as I said, G times L. So, so if one considers the limit in which G becomes infinite, the, the strong coupling limit, then these theories become 11-dimensional theories with 11-dimensional symmetry. So taken together, uh, so, and this 11-dimensional theory has been, was, was named M-theory, a name that Wooden introduced, uh, where he suggested the letter M should stand for magical or mysterious although various people over the years have suggested other things that start with the letter M. Uh, and in any case, taken together with the uh, S and T dualities, this implies that there's in fact a unique underlying theory. So this kind of summarizes how everything's related. So we had these five theories in 10 dimensions uh, lined up here. And uh, the T duality relates to the type two type two theories, and it also relates the uh, E8 times E8 theory to the SO32 heterotic theory, and the S duality relates the SO32 heterotic to type 1, and then, going, and then the type 2A and the EA times EA are related to the M theory. So everything is connected, and this implies that, that all these things are just different limits of a single underlying theory. So T duality was the radius to 1 over radius relation, and S duality was the interaction strength G to the interaction strength 1 over G. So th this was great because we didn't want five theories of nature. We wanted one theory of nature. So, th so this was very pleasing. Uh, there was another duality discovered a few years later in the later part of the 1990s by Juan Maldacena, which goes by the name of ADS-CFT duality and the various other names for it as well. And uh, it's, it's quite different from the other dualities. This relates string theory or M theory, certain string theory or M theory geometries that contain some negatively curved space called an anti de Sitter space. So de Sitter was a person's name, and he introduced something called de Sitter space, which has positive curvature. And if you do the same kind of construction with negative curvature, it's called anti de Sitter space. So, so that's uh, anti was not his name. Uh, and, uh, in any case, uh, this negatively curved, when you have the, the, these theories with this negatively curved type of space, it turns out that the string theory or M theory is actually equivalent to a quantum field theory that's localized on the boundary of this space. And this is a very bizarre, and all these things are bizarre and surprising. This one is particularly so, and, and particularly uh, profound. And it, even though it was discovered more than 15 years ago, uh, it still remains a very active area of research, and people are still trying <laughs> to understand it better. What are the dimensions? Pardon? What are the dimensions now? The dimensions. OK. Yeah. So, right. So, so, so string theory is typically 10 dimensions. M theory is typically 11 dimensional. And the dimension of the quantum field theory on the boundary depends upon which example you consider. So in any case, the boundary is always less than 10 or 11. It's, it's typically 3, 4, or 5, something like that, 6 maybe. Be the, 6 would be the largest. And uh, uh, so since the string theory, M theory, is related to a quantum field theory in a lower dimension, one says that these are holographic descriptions. Because holography is the idea that you represent three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional photographic plate. So here we're representing some 10 or 11 dimensional theory on some, that's being equivalent to some lower dimensional theory. So, so that's called holographic. And so, so, so holographic duality is another name for ADS-CFT duality. This is an enormous subject. One could give many lectures on it. And, and it's fascinating, but that's all I'm going to say about it. So 
understanding this duality changed my attitude, as well as a lot of other people's attitude towards the status of string theory. So for, for many years, string theory was regarded as a radical and speculative alternative to quantum field theory for describing quantum gravity and unification. And I would have subscribed to that statement myself, even as a believer. Uh, but following the discovery of this ADS-CFT duality and other developments that I haven't mentioned, it's become clear that string theory isn't radical at all. It's the inevitable framework for the, for the logical completion of quantum field theory. So, to summarize part three, uh, we found f the five ten-dimensional superstring theories were discovered in the 1980s. One of them has solutions with many realistic features, including parity violation. In the 1990s, we discovered various equivalences or dualities, and to deduce that there's a unique underlying theory, which can also give 11 dimensions. The case for the fundamental correctness of string theory or M theory, I should add in here, in my opinion, is compelling. I'm sure there are people theoretical physicists who wouldn't subscribe to that statement, but anyway, I think most of the people who work in this subject would. Uh, are, there, are there any questions before I go further? Supergravity as well. So supergravity uh, <coughs> is a extension of general relativity that uh, incorporates supersymmetry, and it gives a good description of the, some of the low energy properties of string theory. So, so sometimes the, these uh, dualities may, may be applicable in low energy limits and in such a setup uh, string theory, uh, supergravity would be relevant. So, so certainly in studying, when, when it relates to quantum field theory to string theory, in certain limits you can approximate the string theory by supergravity theory. And so you can at least discuss, discuss these dualities in certain limits using supergravity. So the lattice comes up there. Two, right? Pardon? The comes up there. Yeah, so this 11-dimensional M theory has a low energy description, approximation. So there's, an, there's a low energy approximation to M theory, which is 11-dimensional supergravity. That's, 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 that's right. So the 11 is discovered in supergravity. Yes. You say though that there are five superstring series, and one of them has solutions with, with uh, parity violations. Yes. Well, what about the other ones. Yeah. So nowadays we have enough tricks up our sleeves that we can get parity violation out of anything. But uh, and if you just look in what you the structures that you have in ten dimensions, uh, the uh, type two A theory was was left right symmetrical, so it didn't have any uh, parity violation. M theory is left right symmetrical. It doesn't. Have Violation, but the um, the other theories do in ten dimensions. Okay, so I'm running a little bit late. Uh, so let me just so, so let me just summarize that there are many challenges that remain. We are far from achieving all of our goals. We it's clear that to solve many of the remaining problems, we're going to. Do, need to develop more mathematical techniques. There's been a very fruitful interaction between string theory and mathematics, which is part of the justification for institutes like this one. And, uh, and so, uh, so that's ongoing. And it, if one were to ask me what is the equation of this theory, this unified theory that contains all these five string theories, I couldn't give you an answer because we don't know it. So this is a little embarrassing. We understand, that we know that there's a unique theory, and we understand it well in various limits that are described by the different string theories that I mentioned. But we don't have a single concise equation that describes the whole system at once. So, so there's clearly more that needs to be done to find a complete and compelling formulation of the theory. We'd like to understand what's called dark energy, well, we'd like to understand, explain elementary particle physics. That requires getting the right choice for the extra dimensions, among other things. We'd like to understand space-time and quantum mechanics. There are some exciting new ideas 
that relate the existence of a space-time geometry to very quantum mechanical concepts, which I think are going to be an important theme in the future. We'd like to understand the origin and evolution of the universe. This is not a modest program. Uh, <laughs> we'd like to understand the behavior of black holes. And, and what's, what's a very active area of research in recent years is applying the methodology of string theory to other branches of physics. So the, the, in particular, this ADS-CFT duality uh, turns out has interesting applications to condensed matter physics, to nuclear physics, to hydrodynamics, to all sorts of things. It's quite fascinating. So to conclude, string theory has evolved remarkably over the past 45 years. It's now unifying disciplines as well as forces and particles. And it'll probably take many generations to answer all of our questions. Even though it's a very ambitious project, the string theory community is making good progress. And I think that's all one can ask for. So thank you. More questions. Don't be shy. Uh, you mentioned before about uh, discovering um, squarks and leptons, the supersymmetry particles. What kind of properties would those matter particles have, right. and how would they differ okay. from the supersymmetry? Right. So, the mathematics of supersymmetry pretty much tells us everything about these partner particles except what their mass is. And so we're not sure what the mass is, and that's why we're unsure whether they will be discovered at the LHC. The LH, using special relativity, you know, you, you turn energy into mass equal mc squared. So when you collide protons at very high energy, the higher the energy, the bit more mass you can produce in a collision. So, so when they double the energy of the LHC, as they will, they'll be able to explore further in mass. So that's why we can still remain optimistic, since they, they're going to do that. Uh, so even though we don't know what these masses are without their discovery, there are several arguments that suggest that the order of magnitude of the mass should be in the range that they're exploring. But none of those arguments is totally convincing, so, I could, so that might not be the case. But, but that, that's wide, widely believed. What does, uh, what does string theory have to say about uh, the special relativity limits on, uh, uh, on not exceeding the velocity of light? I'm, I, I didn't catch the last phrase. Not exceeding the velocity of light. What does yes. Um, so, so it's important that particles shouldn't go faster than the speed of light. Uh, if you only know special relativity and you play with the equations, you can consider things that do go faster than the speed of light. They even have names. They're called tachyons. And there was this crazy claim a year or two ago about discovering hmm, tachyonic mass for neutrinos, which all any sensible physicist knew was wrong very immediately. Uh, and, and, and then it turned out that they had, I don't know, mismeasured the length of some cable or something. And some ridiculous mistake like that. And the, uh, so even though it's sensible just from the point of view of special relativity to consider tachyonic masses, it doesn't make sense in a quantum theory because it implies that the vacuum is unstable and decays. And that's just wrong. Hopefully. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> well, if not, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> <laughs>